chapter, reading from verse 1. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their homes. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, How much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 400. Then he asked the second, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, Take your bill, and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men. But God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. We are continuing our journey with the parabolic sayings of Jesus, these stories that reveal divine truths of who God is and how we can connect to God and how we can grow into the children God wants us to become. Some of them are just sayings, some of them are parabolic stories that actually drive home a central point. Our parable today, our story about the shrewd steward, is an odd story. It's actually set in the context of some bad examples. It's somewhat unlike some of the other parables that have a lot of imagery that is easily understood and easily emulated. So this particular parable kind of at first glance, strikes us the wrong way. Yeah, Jesus is lifting up somebody who is dishonest, somebody who is irresponsible, somebody who's been given management and done a lousy job with that management. I guess the right place for us to start is to examine this thought of stewardship because it's a little bigger than management. I think management gets 
our conversation started because we are familiar with managers, somebody who's employed to take care of a business or over staff or over a portion of the business. But a steward was somebody much more important than just a manager. A steward was somebody who was given charge of the entire family, the entire business. And the best biblical example we can find is when Joseph is sold by his brothers into slavery and ends up in Egypt, Potiphar buys him and makes him a steward. And the scripture tells us that eventually Joseph ran all of Potiphar's business. There was nothing that Potiphar had to worry about. Every aspect of his life was under the care of Joseph. In fact, when Potiphar's wife starts pursuing Joseph, Joseph finally has a conversation with her and he says this, everything that my master has, has been placed into my care. I have the opportunity and the responsibility to do just what I want. The only thing he has withheld from me is you. And now you want me to betray the trust. You want me to take that which he has asked me not to take. I will not. In fact, when she forces the issue, Joseph hightails it out of there. Joseph is a beautiful example of a good manager, a good steward. In fact, he's one of those sad examples where no good deed goes unpunished because he is such a good manager and because he will not do what Potiphar's wife wants him to do, she slanders him and she gets him thrown into prison and he is seemingly forgotten. All his hard work, all his good intentions, seemingly forgotten. I'm sure there must have been some dark nights of the soul for Joseph as he's rotting in prison and thinking about what on earth? Why did this happen to me? But thank God he didn't stay there long because the scriptures tell us that after a while, the jailer noticed the good stewardship that Joseph had. And eventually, Joseph is the steward for even the jail, taking care of others, being responsible, using every opportunity to forward the wonderful name of God. Stewardship can happen in any context, in any place. In fact, Jesus will say, when you are faithful with little, God can entrust you with much. Prison doesn't seem to be a good place to have to be a steward, but think about it. Some of the most needy souls in our society are in prison. What a place to be a bright shining light. What a place to share the counsel of God. What a place to live as a good example when most of them maybe have been surrounded by poor examples and themselves have been poor examples. So the place doesn't matter. What matters is if you and I take the opportunity and use it to full effect. Stewardship involves your time, your most precious commodity, your time, your talents, whatever skills God has given you, and your treasures, those resources that God has placed at your disposal. In our text today, we've got a manager who has wasted what the master has placed in his care. Wasted his time. Wasted his talents. Wasted his treasures. I'm not sure what that looked like. We can explore that for a moment. What does wasting mean? Well, maybe on first glance, it just means doing a bad job, a lousy job. Not showing up to work on time. Not doing what you were asked to do. Not looking out for the interests of the business. Or in this case, the household. A steward would take care of every aspect of life together, making sure everybody had what everybody needed. So maybe at first glance, wasting means somebody that's irresponsible, somebody that's careless, somebody that does a poor job. But maybe it gets even worse than that. Maybe wasting means misappropriating. Rather than doing what the master expected, he's kind of siphoning off and padding his own account, looking out for his own interests. Rather than do what benefits his master, he's got his 
own selfish interests going at the same time. Double dipping. Not doing a good job as far as looking out for the interests of his master. Maybe embezzling. Or maybe wasting means rather than helping matters, he's hurting matters. Maybe the staff are all tangled up. Maybe relationships with customers are at an all-time low, a poor image of the company because the steward is not doing what he was asked to do. I'm not sure what all was involved, but the word came back to the owner, to the master. Your steward is wasting. And so he immediately called him in and said, you better give an account because you no longer have a job. And the text then takes us to this place where he's now in a predicament. He says, I'm too weak or maybe too old to go out in the field and dig, be a, a construction worker or a farmhand, and I'm too ashamed to have to go and beg, so what am I going to do? Think, 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 ah, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to use my dishonest skills to at least open some doors of opportunity for me in the future. Call in the debtors. Tell me how much you owe. We'll give you a little bit of a break here. We'll give you a bit of a discount. So that when the time comes that I'm fired, I'm going to come back and I'm going to call in a couple of favors. I at least want you to be friendly and helpful toward me. And I'm going to remind you of what I did for you and say, and now, what can you do for me? And Jesus says, I want you to take note of the shrewd way this steward, this manager, looked to his future. The central point, the nail that Jesus is trying to drive home, is that often people in the world, often for bad motives, are shrewd, are cunning, are clever. And the challenge is, are you thoughtful, shrewd, cunning? clever when it comes to God and to God's business? Do you think about who God is and what He's done for you? Do you think about the opportunities He's given you? Are you willing to take your time, talents and treasures and use them for the kingdom advantage? And Jesus goes on to say, this opportunity to use worldly wealth will create friendships, will create relationships that you can use that will impact eternity. Because here's the sad truth. You and I come into this world naked and we're going to leave just the same way. None of your treasures are going to go with you. You can use them to full effect here, but once this life is over, they're all staying behind. But if you have used them for the kingdom, you can actually impact eternity. Not just for yourself, but for those that you have touched because you have used your talents shrewdly. This guy was thinking about his future and so he started creating friendships or acquaintances or contacts to try and make sure his future looked a little brighter. He has your challenge. When it comes to the kingdom of God, are you using what you've got to make the future look brighter? Not just for yourself, but for others. Are you taking what you have and putting it in the hands of God and saying, God, how do you want to use this so that lives can be touched, so that relationships can be formed, so that I can be a blessing as a steward for you in the lives of others? One of the best examples is the little boy who had his little lunch, and there was a big crowd and lots of hungry people, and finally he takes his little lunch into the hands of the disciples, and he says, I don't know if you can use this. It's not much. And they give it to Jesus and Jesus doesn't throw his hands up and say, well, what am I supposed to do with this little lunch? No. Jesus takes that little lunch and offers it to the Father and prays over it. And it feeds many people. You've got a lunch. I've got a lunch. You've got time and you've got talents and you've got treasures. And the point is, will you become shrewd with them? Will you become clever in the way you use them? Sometimes life gets hard. This Manager now is having to pay for his dishonesty. This is a bad day in his life. Right now he's being faced with a lemon. But he's shrewd enough to turn that lemon into lemonade. 
Are you shrewd enough? Are you willing to take whatever you're facing and prayerfully put it before God and say, God, how do you want to use this? I've really been thinking a lot this past week about sickness. We've got a lot of sickness around us. A lot of terminal sickness, a lot of people suffering, a lot of people getting ready to die. There's bad news. You too are going to face hardship. You too are going to get sick possibly along the way. You too are going to have to die. And you can become paralyzed by that. You can become depressed. Feel sorry for yourself. Think the whole world has ended. Or you can say, God, even in this crisis, how do I become shrewd? How do I become cunning? How do I become clever and say, how can I use this for your kingdom's purpose? And so you might ask me, well, how do you use an illness or the possibility of death for God's kingdom? Well, firstly, when you realize that every one of us is living with the reality of death every day, it wakens us to the fact that your relationship with God needs to be deep and close. That you are ready to leave at a moment's notice. So if we use that bad news to full effect, rather than feel down in the dumps, we can say, Lord, here's my wake-up call. I'm going to make sure that my relationship with you is what it should be. And maybe there's some unfinished business with loved ones, friends. Maybe they're strained relationships. That's your opportunity to say, Lord, I'm going to go and make those things right. I'm going to make sure that I've mended the fence. I'm going to make sure that we're on good terms with each other. I'm going to make sure that I do everything I can with what I have. I see people who have just a few months left and they're trying their very best to get everything in order. You know why? Because they're taking the lemon and they're going to make lemonade out of it. They're not going to stop. They're not going to give up. They're not going to throw their hands up in the air and say, why is this happening to me and what am I supposed to do? No. It's hard. It's disappointing. But we take that to Jesus and say, and how are we going to handle this one, Lord? And he can take you deeper and grow you stronger. And he can make you more effective. I think that's the whole point. That to be shrewd, to be cunning, to be clever, is to understand that your life before God is of great consequence. And each of us must make the very most of what lies ahead. And then he goes on to deal with the Pharisees. Because it's interesting that the observation from Luke is that the Pharisees love money. And when they hear Jesus talk about stewardship, they are irritated. They are sneering at him. And Jesus doesn't back off and say, sorry guys, I didn't mean to offend you. No. He deals with maybe what is a stronghold in everybody's life. You're either living for God or you're living for yourself. You're either a good steward and cunning and clever about the kingdom or you're out trying to make another deal, another dollar. You're all focused on yourself. You can either serve God or mammon or money. And money represents all the things we want in life. That's why money is so powerful. Because we attach all our hopes and all our dreams and all our efforts to it. We become absorbed by it. And Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees at this stage, but he's dealing with all of us. Very quickly, we can lose our sense of stewardship with God and be in this for ourselves, just like this dishonest manager was. Yeah, it's a bad example, but it's a good example because we're all guilty of it. It doesn't take much for us to forget that there's a God who's entrusted everything into our care, that everything we have is His. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The very opening charge, instruction that God gave Adam and Eve was to, to be stewards over the earth. Be fruitful and multiply and have dominion. Be stewards over all I've given you. We're not in this for ourselves. God is taking care of us. But we're living for more than ourselves. We're living for, for Him and for His purpose. And so Jesus will say it this way, and I'll close with this. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Be sure to be a good steward for God and God's purpose. Make sure you take what you've got and use it to full effect. God wants you to be shrewd, cunning, 
clever when it comes to living for the kingdom. Let us pray. Lord, forgive us for being careless or worse yet, selfish or worse yet, dishonest, stealing, wheeling and dealing like this dishonest manager. Help us to be a good steward like Joseph was where Potiphar could entrust everything he had in his hands and knew he was in good hands. May our hands be good hands. May our stewardship be shrewd and cunning and clever for the kingdom. May you be well pleased with us so that when we pass from this life into the next, we will hear you say, well done, good and faithful steward. Amen.